Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. Just read in the King James something that we know. But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Look at me. This is not heaven. This is not afterlife. This is not in the sweet by and by. This is not somewhere beyond the blue. This is not over the next mountain. God has planned for you things that you've never seen, things that you've never heard, things that's never entered into your heart. God has planned for you. But look at verse 10. We know this, but tonight's going to be a revelation. And if you think you heard the message, you haven't because there's about 10 new revelations in it tonight. Verse 10, but God has revealed them unto us by His Spirit. So what do we need to get the things that eye hath not seen and ear hath not heard that has never come up in the heart of man? We need the Spirit of God because it's the Spirit that will reveal it. But how will this revelation break through? So we got to do verse 7 and 8. He says, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. You know, if you come into God's presence, the thing that will struck you is glory. Okay, when Moses heard of God, the only thing he desired is, let me see your glory. When God wanted to destroy the Israelites and Moses said, no God, you are merciful. God said, I will stick to my word of mercy, but as sure as I live. So God is bringing the fact that he is forever living into the promise that he's giving. As sure as I live, the earth shall be filled with my glory. When Isaiah was caught up into the glories of heaven and he saw the angels around the throne, this is what they were screaming and shouting when the doorpost was shaking and the house was filled with smoke. They said, the whole earth is full of His glory. Now everybody or many people preach how great destruction is going to come, how tribulation is going to come, how false prophets and false Christs are going to come. But I tell you the thing that we need to preach is the glory must come. God didn't promise calamities will fill the earth. God didn't promise tribulation will fill the earth. God promised that my glory Glory shall fill all the earth. So glory is on God's agenda. I'm sorry for all the tribulation preachers, but God's on, on God's agenda is I want glory on this earth, man. God wants glory on this earth. Okay, so that's on the agenda. So the Bible says, you know, we speak a wisdom. Verse 7, are you there? We preach a glory, we preach a wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Come on, Habakkuk is a great revival, revival message. Habakkuk 3 says, Oh God, I've heard thy report and I was fearful. So would you remember in wrath, would you remember your mercy and revive your work in the midst of the years? So Habakkuk is a great revival chapter. But just before we go to the fact where he cries out for revival, in Habakkuk 2 verse 14 he says, The whole earth, as the waters cover the sea, the knowledge of of the glory of the Lord shall cover the earth. People, God is about to bring glory into the earth. So he says, he has prepared us unto glory. If you want to, I, I could quote scriptures now, man. Romans 9 verse 22 says, even though God want to show his wrath, he's merciful because of the vessels that is we, if you look it up in the Bible, those who he, he has prepared unto glory. So God has prepared you for glory. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 5 and 6 says, we have the treasure of the light of this glory on the inside of earthen vessels. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 18 says, we will be changed from the glory of the law into the glory of the New Testament. He, from the glory of condemnation to the glory of freedom, boldness and liberty. We will be changed from the glory of Moses into the glory of Christ. Christ is on his agenda. My glory must come to the earth. Okay, now look at this. Verse number 8. For none of the princes, now jump to the Amplified, none of the rulers of this age all world perceived and recognized and understood this. For if they had, they would never have crucified the Lord of glory. This glory that's about to hit the earth and is going to hit you. The rulers. Oh, man. Of a specific. This age. 
this world. Tonight is going to hit you, man. The rulers of this age and world, if they knew that the glory is going to come. <laughs> if they knew about the coming of the glory, they would never, 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 these people would never have crucified. Never, never, never have crucified the Lord Jesus Christ. So what is the key towards the glory filling all the earth? The crucified Jesus Christ. That's why Paul cries out in just the previous few verses, I want to know nothing amongst you, nothing, nothing, except Christ and Him crucified. Him we preach, for this is the power of God. What is the power of God? The crucified Christ. Okay, so one more scripture that we can throw in before we read. First Peter chapter 1 is an awesome portion of scripture. And this is what he says. All the prophets of old prophesied and looked forward and studied and tried to find out of which age and which time they prophesied by the spirit of Christ which was in them when they prophesied about the sufferings of the Christ. You can check it out there, First Peter chapter 1. The sufferings of the Christ and the glory that should follow. So I'm sorry. Tribulation is not the following of the crucifixion. Calamities is not the following of the... Out of the crucifixion is supposed to follow the glory of the Almighty God. Now they prophesied and said they didn't know which time this glory would come. But then it says, but they prophesied that at the end... It will be revealed. So there will be a generation that will find out we're not going to preach destruction. We're not going to preach calamities. We're not. Somebody has to preach glory is about to fill all the earth. Okay. So let's go to John chapter 16 as well as John chapter 12. Now what did I say? Verse 10 says, we need the Holy Spirit. For God reveals the things that eye does not see, ear does not. God reveals them to us by the Spirit. Okay? So in verse 7, Jesus is talking to the disciples. He's just about to be crucified. Okay? Come on. The next chapters, Jesus is going to get seven. He's going to be crucified now, man. So he says, verse 7, however, I am telling you nothing but the truth. When I say it is profitable... It is good, it is expedient, it is advantageous for you that I go away. Because if I do not go away, the comforter, the counselor, the helper, the advocate, the intercessor, the strengthener, the standby, a lot of words for the Holy Spirit, will not come to you into close fellowship with you. But if I go away, I will send him to you to be in close fellowship with you. And when he comes, he will convict and he will convince the world and bring demonstration to it about sin, about righteousness, and about judgment. Keep your finger there and quickly turn back to John chapter 12. Verse 27, Jesus is already talking to them. This is at the Last Supper and he's talking to them about the crucifixion. He says in verse 27, Now my soul is troubled and distressed. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour of trial and agony. But it was for this very purpose that I have come to this hour, that I might undergo it. Rather, I will say, Father, glorify your name. Then there came a voice out of heaven saying, I have already glorified it and I will glorify it again. The crowd of bystanders heard the sound and said that it thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has not come for my sake, but for your sake. Now, he's saying glorify. God says, I will glorify. And Jesus is talking about the cross. He said, Father, I mean, when he prayed, let this cup pass from me. Now he said, oh, Father, this trial is coming, but this is the hour that I came for. This is the very purpose that I came to earth for, is to die on the cross. Okay? He says, now, if I go to the cross, this is my prayer. Glorify your name. God spoke, said, I have glorified, I will glorify it again. So after the sufferings must come the glory of God. Okay? Verse 31. 
Talking about the glory and the cross. Now the judgment of this world is coming on. Listen to this. Sentence is now being passed on this world. Now the ruler of this world shall be cast out. And I, when I'm lifted up from the earth, that's the cross, will draw all to me, that is all judgment, not men as the Amplified would say, verse 33. He said this to signify in what manner he would die. Now you've got to fasten all your religious seat belts. No, just cut them off. Release yourself and loosen yourself. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, if the rulers of this age, in other words, when he was living as a man on the earth, of this world, so it's a specific age world rulers. If those rulers knew who this was that they were crucifying, they would never crucify him because knowing that he is actually the Lord of glory. And the crucifixion, they would never have crucified him if they knew that the crucifixion is going to bring about the glory on the face of the earth. And another age and another generation will get the revelation. And if I appreciate the crucifixion and not preach damnation, I will step into the fact that I will walk in the glory. I will see the visible glory. I will touch the glory. I will move and manifest in the glory of the almighty God. Okay, back to chapter 16. Okay, he says, the Holy Spirit will convict about judgment. Sin because they do not believe in me. Righteousness because I go to the Father. About judgment because the ruler of this world is judged and condemned and sentenced Already is passed upon him. If these rulers knew, they would never have crucified him. But the crucifying by these rulers is going to bring about the glory. So who crucified him? The rulers. Of who? A certain age and a certain world. Now Jesus said, if I'm lifted up to be crucified. You know what the crucifixion will do? It will judge the rulers of that world. And if I'm crucified, the Holy Spirit will then come, as we heard. And if the Holy Spirit come, He will convict you that the judgment, the sentence has already been passed and these rulers of that world and that age has already been judged. Finish. So the crucifixion judged the rulers of that age and that world which crucified him because they did not know the power outflowing the crucifixion is the glory of the almighty God. Man, I I must take some time to get this into you. Okay, just keep it there and go to Hebrews 8 and Hebrews 9. No law, no sin. No law, no sin, no judgment. No law, no sin, no judgment, no condemnation. Is that all right? So what convicts you that you have sinned? The law. What happens if the law says you have sinned? You are judged. What happens after you are judged? You are condemned to whatever sentence they're going to give to you. But now Jesus comes and he says, if I am crucified, the crucifixion is going to be judgment. And that judgment will be on the rulers of that world and that age in which he was living. And when that judgment is where the crucifixion is finished, that judgment will be finished and sentence would have already been passed upon them. It is the crucifixion will judge the rulers of the age and the time that Jesus lived in. Okay? Now, if you want to look at the word rulers in the New Testament, this is where you will find it. Rulers of the? No, synagogue. 
Okay, if you read the four Gospels, the ruler of the synagogue, ruler of the synagogue, ruler of the synagogue. Who was that? The Jewish leaders of the day and age Jesus lived in. Who delivered him to be crucified? Who screamed crucify him? Did the Romans crucify Jesus? No. Pilate said, I find no fault in him. The Roman prosecutor said, I set him free. The rulers cried out, crucify him, crucify him. Who was instigating the fact that they should crucify him? Another ruler called Satan. Okay, the ruler of that age. Satan was instigating the mob. Sorry, just stick with me for a moment. Who was he instigating? The rulers of the Judaistic system, the Pharisees said, Sadducees, the scribes, the rulers of the synagogue, they said, away with him. Pilate said, I find no fault. The Romans did not sentence him or crucified him. The Roman prosecutor said, he's free. I find no fault in him. Sorry. Listen to Hebrews chapter 9. He says, Chapter 8. Are you ready? Verse 12. I will be merciful and gracious towards their sin. And I will remember their deeds of unrighteousness no more. When God speaks of a new, He makes the first one absolute. You've got to stick with me. What is absolute? Out of use and annulled because of age is ripe for disappearance and to be dispensed with all together. Now the first covenant, which is the law, had its own rules and regulations for divine worship. And it had a sanctuary, but one of this world. So I will make statements and then we will qualify them. This world and age which had rulers which crucified Christ because they didn't know who he was. He came unto his own, his own received him not. They crucified him because of the law. They kept the, the law says, the law says, the law says. Now Jesus says, if I am lifted up on the cross, it'll be the judgment of the rulers of this age and world. And when I am crucified and the Holy Spirit comes, He will convict and convince you that judgment sentence is now finished and passed on the rulers. So Hebrews chapter 8, or chapter 8 verse 12 and 13 says, This is now ready to disappear. No law, no sin. No sin, no judgment. No judgment, no condemnation. Okay? The Bible says, without the law, sin has no power. But sin gets its power because of the law. So, who is in control of sin? Satan is. If you talk about sin, who will you bring into the picture? The devil. Will you? Okay. How can he let you know that you have sinned? Only because of the law. If I drive on the road... And there is no boards. I don't know what speed to drive. They don't punish me because I drove 140. They punish me because the law says you must only do 120. So that's, it's not because of your sin. It's because of the law's command. Somebody will get it. So it's not because of what you did. It's because of what the law says you're not allowed to do. So there were regulations and rules. So Hebrews chapter 9 says, the first covenant, the first law, the, the temple, synagogue, tabernacle thing had rules and regulations. It is called the law of Moses. If you obeyed the law, you could have been stoned and killed immediately. Okay? So the only way you knew you did wrong is if somebody said what the law said. If there was no law, people lived rebellious and did just what they wanted to. But who caused people to sin? 
Satan. Okay, who came in the garden? Satan. Did he challenge the people? Did he deceive the people? Did he come and mislead the people? Did he come and tempt the people? So he's called the tempter, he's called the deceiver, and he's called the accuser. He's called Satan, serpent, and dragon. He's the deceiver, he's a liar, he's a tempter. So who come and tell you to sin? Satan. Who come to accuse you after you sin? The law. Who uses the law to accuse you? Satan. No, Satan can't use God's law. Okay, if there's no law, there can't be an accuser. uh, Okay, back to chapter 16 and 17. John chapter 16. So the Holy Spirit will convince you and convict you about judgment. Okay, keep it there. John 12 verse 31 now the judgment of this world is coming sentence is now being passed on this world now the ruler of this world shall be cast out what shall happen to him cast out okay verse 11 of 16 now the holy spirit will convict you about this judgment what is this judgment he will be cast out because the ruler of this world is judged and condemned and sentence is already passed upon him people struggle to get free from the law but after tonight you will not get struggle to get free from the law so satan i'm sorry religious people satan is placed in the same category as the law they both called rulers of this age and this world so jesus says when i'm crucified and the holy spirit comes to after the crucifixion he will convince and convict you judgment is passed on the rulers of this age which is the law which is satan and it'll let you know that satan as well as the law is now finished with sentence has been passed they are cast out and they are ready for disappearance colossians chapter 2 Verse 13, and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. In other words, you were part of the law. Your sensuality, your sinful carnal nature. God brought to life together with Christ, having freely forgiven us all our transgressions. I hope this good news will hit somebody. If it's hitting me, I hope it will hit somebody else. Hebrews 8 verse 12, of their sin and unrighteousness, I will remember no more. Why? Because I will be gracious and merciful towards their sin and unrighteousness. And if he says the old is gone, it's ready for disappearance. What is the old? The law. So when Jesus died, he finished the law. And what did he bring in? Grace and mercy. What does grace and mercy say? I can't remember that you've sinned. You are free. From the law of sin and death Who had power over death? Satan Hebrews chapter 2 Did Jesus annul death on the cross? He did Hebrews 2 So are we free? So they are ready for disappearance The law and Satan So how come people are so aware of Satan? He has freely forgiven you How did he forgive you? Verse 14 Having cancelled Blotted out Wiped away The handwriting of the note with its legal decrees and demands which was in force and stood against us. This note with its regulations, decrees and demands, rules, he set aside and clearly completed out of our way by nailing it to his cross. Now, now look this way. Would you take the Amplified and help me? We did this so many times in the past. This message is the one that I've preached since 83. The greatest message I ever had and preached. Okay? We call it the law. The law says, you can't. You shall not. The law says, do. The law says, don't. Okay? So if I can, the law will say, you shouldn't have been gone. So now because you can, you're condemned. You shall not. If I shall, I'm condemned. If I do, if I'm supposed to don't, if I don't supposed to do, I've got troubles. And this thing was against me. 
Is that true? A written code that says, you shall not, you know, do this. You shall not do that. And you do it and you condemn. Now, can we read? This legal written law, he took it to the cross. What did he do with it? First of all, he canceled. Have you ever seen a check that's canceled? He canceled it. Blotted is, you know, you had the paper when you messed the ink, blotted it down. First blotted. Then he? Then he? Set it aside. Cleared it completely out of the way by so it's disappeared so how can we still be judged by the law condemned by the law read the law the bible says as long as they read the law second Corinthians, they will never get the glory they will never get the revelation of the Spirit. But if they repent to the Spirit, they will be changed from the glory of the law to the glory of the new, which is Christ Himself. Okay? So, the law is gone. Okay? What happened? Who used the law? God. No, Satan. Okay? Don't be scared and don't be ugly. Read the next verse. God disarmed the principalities. The powers that were ranged against us and made a bold display and public example of them in triumphing over them in him and in it that is the cross. Okay, what does Ephesians 6 say? Who do we wrestle with? Principalities, rulers, powers in the heavenlies. But what happened to the rulers, the principalities, and the powers? When Christ was crucified, the first thing he did, he cleared the law out of the way. Nail it to the cross. And in nailing it to the cross, he took the armor away, the law, which Satan could use against you, the rulers. So there's two rulers. The one is the law and the other one is Satan himself, the devil. That's the two rulers of that age. That's the two rulers of that world. But Jesus Christ, when he died, he took that world rulers. They did not know what was coming. That's why they crucified him. Satan instigated the rulers of the synagogue. So there's two rulers. The ruler Satan, the ruler of the synagogue. The two of them worked together. They got Christ crucified. If they knew it, that glory was going to come, they wouldn't have done it. But now they've done it, and when they did it, judgment was sentenced upon them. And their judgment was, they have got no more say in your life. No law, no sin, no judgment, no condemnation. I will never remember your sin and your unrighteousness anymore. I'm going to be merciful towards your sin and unrighteousness. I'm going to set you free, the cross. That's why I want to know nothing except Christ and Him crucified. For that is the power of God unto salvation for everyone that will believe. Leave, man. Right? Verse 16, to prove it to you. Therefore, let no one sit in judgment on you. In matters of food, drink, that's a tough one. Or with regard to a feast day, or a new moon, or a Sabbath. You heard it preached, now you've got to keep the Sabbath trash. Such things, if somebody judges you on the Sabbath, he's working with Satan. With a ruler that's been judged. Every day is the same day. Every day is a holy day. Every day is a new day. Every day is a great day. I'm sorry. We're not going to go back to Jewish rituals. Christ finished it. Such things are only the shadow of things that are to come and they have only a symbolic value. But the reality... Belongs to Christ. So let no one defraud you by acting as an umpire and declaring you unworthy and disqualifying you for the prize. Don't let anybody sit in judgment on you and disqualify you for the prize. Turn back to chapter 1. 
we're going to read the scripture and then maybe preach a little. Verse 11. We pray that you may be invigorated and strengthened with all power according to the might of His glory. Okay, if you don't get the glory, you can't get invigorated and strengthened. Every kind of endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father. Let's see if you got it. Who has qualified. So don't let anybody judge you and make you disqualified. Who has qualified and made us fit for the prize to share the portion which is the inheritance of the saints in the light, which is the glory. He prepared us for glory. 1 Corinthians 2. Now listen to verse 13. The Father has delivered and drawn us to Himself out of the control and the dominion, that is the rulership, of darkness and has transferred us into the kingdom of the Son of His love in whom we have our redemption through His blood, which means the forgiveness of our sins. Clap, anybody. So on this side, on this side, it's the kingdom of darkness. It's sin and Satan. And the way they intimidate you is with the law. But that was wiped away, blotted out, canceled, cleared, nailed to the cross, and ready to disappear. So don't let anybody sit in judgment. So God delivered us, took us through the blood of the cross into the kingdom of His Son. Okay. So on this side, the sins of the fathers are visited to the third and the fourth generation of those that hate me. On this side, if you disobey the law, you can be stoned on the witness of two or three. On this side, you could never have a clear conscience. On this side, you're always condemned and judged because the law always stands in front of you and Satan is there to accuse you. On this side, you could never live a free, liberated life because it's not the Holy Spirit on this side. It's the law on this side. But when the Spirit comes, He will convict you that this is now finished. But you've got to take it because you've been delivered from the kingdom. And now you are qualified to receive the inheritance of the glory. The price is yours. You don't have to labor for it. You don't have to work for it. Christ said it is finished. So the only thing you need to do is believe it and go and get it. It's yours for the taking. Keep it there and go to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. Oh, man. Are you ready? This is going to be tough, man. Good tough. Okay. Are you in Colossians 1? You are fit. You share the glory. Now, the Father has delivered us. And has drawn us to Himself. He has delivered us. He has drawn us to Himself. Out of the control and the dominion of darkness. And has transferred us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. In whom we have redemption through His blood. Which means the forgiveness of our sins. So the cross spells something out very loud the blood of Jesus Ephesians calls it the blood of the cross Colossians calls it the blood of the cross so it's the blood of the cross of Christ that has redeemed us and now we have been transferred pastor pray for me I need to be transferred please pray for me I need to be transferred I want to come work in Klagsdorf would you pray for me that my wife will get a transfer? That means you're not here anymore. You're now here. So if you want to go back there, you've got to go over the dead body of Christ. So the minute you go back here, you make finish the work of the cross. 
Galatians chapter 3 says, the minute you go back to the law, Christ has got no meaning in your life. Galatians 3, 4, and 5 says, if you want to go back to the law, you have no portion in Christ. Hebrews chapter 6 says, if you go back to the law, you crucify Christ a second time. But working in the negative direction, and then there's no more repentance for sin. Okay? So, if I want to go back to find out how my old life looked, what happened to me on this side? I've got to cancel my transference. That means I've got to cancel the work of the blood. Then I can cross and finish the work of Christ and make it null and then go find out what happened when I was living here. Okay, if you don't agree, let's read 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed. Now Colossians just said we were redeemed. We are not redeemed with corruptible things of silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your forefathers. Okay, amplified. You must know and recognize that you were redeemed and ransomed from the useless, fruitless way of living inherited by tradition from your forefathers, not with corruptible things such as silver and gold, but you were purchased with the precious blood of Christ like that of a sacrificial lamb without blemish or spot. If somebody want to understand it, if I receive the crucified Christ, if I receive the blood, there's nothing of my forefathers that can get me out of being transferred into the kingdom of His Son. There's nothing that can keep me from being qualified and getting the inheritance of the saints in the light. If anybody come with this side and want to disqualify you he is of the law and Paul says if they come with another gospel let them be accursed because we've been redeemed by the blood of the lamb we've been transferred from the tradition of our forefathers I don't care what your papa did I don't care what your mama did I don't care what your granddad did I don't care if your father is the bigger switch doctor in the in some land I don't care you know if you come from vendor and you're sitting around and all your forefathers are playing you know with witchcraft stuff it's got nothing to do with you if you said let the blood wash me so if you go for deliverance you actually misusing what Christ did because the word deliverance is used once in the New Testament and that is right here in Colossians 1 verses 13 where it says he the father has delivered us that's the only time the word deliverance is used in the New Testament I'm sorry for you. The other words is ransomed, freed, washed, cleansed, but not delivered. Delivered is used once. You were there and you had to be delivered from the kingdom of darkness. First Peter chapter 2 verse 9. He has translated us and from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. So he has brought us out of darkness into his marvelous light. So I've been transferred from this side to that side. So I'm qualified by him. I get the prize because of him. My sins are gone because of him. Amen. So why, why do people have a problem with sin? Satan. Because they go back to the law. And now they say, listen brother, what, what did your forefathers do? Were your father a sangoma, your mother a witch doctor? If I do that, I'm canceling the work of Christ. I'm sorry, Deliverance Ministries. It's an unscriptural ministry. It's not a scriptural ministry. We don't take people to their past to get rid of their hurts. We take them to the cross and we get them delivered by the Father and the blood of Jesus. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. If you want to deliver people with the law, you are working hand in hand with Satan himself. And you make people feel condemned, you make them feel guilty, and you make them feel judgment coming on them. We take them to the cross and we teach them they are liberated, they are free, they are redeemed, they are washed. Jesus paid the price, it's finished. Wow. There it is in the Bible. Huh? And he has transferred us. Into the kingdom of his dear son. Turn to Ephesians. And Elise is going to read one scripture tonight. I hope you get that. 
Galatians says about the people going back to the law. He says, those heretical teachers go to great lengths to flatter you, but their motives are rotten. They want to shut you out of the free world of God's grace so that you will always depend on them That's for right. approval and depend direction and making them feel important. Yeah. Mm. Have you ever met them? They're so important. Because they can scratch around in your past and the only thing they can use is the law. In 1980, when God gave me the revelation, a light came into my room in the United States of America. It was winter time. I had a Bible that was zipped up. The zip went open by a light shining on the Bible. Bible pages, by a light paging the Bible pages. Now, you would believe if that happens to you. And it stopped at Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 1. This word shall not be used ever again amongst you, that the fathers ate sour grapes and the teeth of the children has become blunt. For thus saith the Lord, you shall be carrying only the sin that you have done. You shall not carry the sin of your fathers. Neither shall the sons carry the sin, sins of their fathers, neither the fathers the sins of their sons. Everybody is there for his own sin. And how do I get rid of it? By saying, forgive me. He says, you're forgiven. Wash me and I'm washed. But if I go back, I got problem. I was in the South African Air Force. 1970 and 71 a portion. And I had a blue uniform with eagles on. Remember? Eagle on the cap, eagles on the sides, eagles here. Man, I was so proud to be in the South African Air Force. But I forgot when I was in school, I applied for a bursary to study with either the South African Army or the South African Navy to become an engineer. Okay? And I was just happy, happy there in the Air Force. And all of a sudden, they called me out, you know. And they said, you know, troop, you know, J.A. Ansefrenberg, 6A44, 1773E, just come out. So I walked out and they said, the Sergeant Major wants to see you. I said, sir, you applied to go to university. I said, yes, but that's three years ago. I said, uh, you, you, you can go for a qualification board. For a qualification board. Not selection board, a qualification board. But you've got to go to Simonstown for the qualification board. So I got in my little car with my little blue uniform. And I drove all the way to Simonstown, and I came in front of the qualification board. We were 302 people coming in front of the qualification board. So they went through all our papers, all our stuff. They said, so why would you leave the Air Force to come to the Navy? I said, no, I, I, it's not that I want to leave it. It's just that I applied to go to university. And, uh, yeah, okay, we let you know. Two weeks later, they called me out again, you know. Troop, J.A. Young, 6, 8, 4, 1, 7, 3, each. Just come, I come out, they say, you've been qualified and elected to go to the South African Navy to become an officer in the South African Navy and to go study for electronical engineer. So uh, I was transferred to the South African Navy. When I got here, the first thing they gave me is bright white clothes. The black uniform we only got after three months. Okay, wait. The other uniform that was your, you know, your, your, your stepping out stuff, you didn't get immediately, but you were immediately issued with a white clothes. So there I was, a candidate officer, you know, in the South African Navy. Man, I was so proud of it. So my cousin came to look for me at Devon Radar Station in Eastern Transvaal. He said, I'm looking for J.A. Yansef and Reisberg. What's his number? 6844-1773-E. Oh, let's just check. Oh, no, there's no such a person. But I was here last week. Where is he? They said, no. But I had an appointment with him. I couldn't even let him know. I forgot to let him know. So they check, check you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yes, his records. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, his records are still. Yeah, he was here for about seven and a half months. Yes. Yeah, I was on that radar station. He worked with Kubis Fester. Yes. Yes. Oh, but there, you see? Last week, Tuesday, he was transferred. So we got, no, he's not here. If you want him, you've got to go to the South African Navy. 
So if I am washed in the blood on this side, those people can't find me anymore because I'm now in another kingdom. I'm washed. I've been transferred. I've got other clothes. They've been made white in the blood of the Lamb. The ruler of that age and that world, the law and Satan has got no more right to me. I'm qualified. I'm fit. I'm a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. Maybe we can do Ephesians 5. I mean 5. Was it 5? 5? Verse 8 says, Sometimes you were darkness, but now you are light. Walk as children of the light. Verse 10, prove what is acceptable to the Lord. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rebuke them. It is a shame even to speak of those things that are done there by them in secret. I'll just leave it there. Do you know how many people talk about darkness? Preachers stand up, forgive me preacher, but you've got to get forgiveness. Stand up and say, oh, just we want to talk today about Satanism and the occult. And we want to help the young people not to get into it. The more you share it, the more they get interested in it. The Bible says, Revelation 2 verse 24, because you do not go into the depths of Satan, you will have no burden on you. And a brother... Oh, dear young people, today we want to talk to you about the rise of Satanism and Islam. And we want to talk to you about, about the Huja board. And the, you, they don't have to talk about Huja board. And they don't have to talk about tarot cards. If they want to talk about that, they can just as well say we want to talk to you about the law. The law works with Judaism. Did you know that tarot card, Huja board, witchcraft originates from Judaism? It's found in the writings of Judas, Judaistic priests and rabbis. And you don't have to look at me. Go to a Judaistic shop. Go buy their books on meditation, the Kabbalah that is rising again now. And see witchcraft. That's why Paul talks about who have bewitched you. That you now go back to the law. So if I go back to the law, I go back to witchcraft and tarot cards and huja boards. If I go back to this, I have no part in Christ. Sorry, don't, don't take me wrong and don't judge me because you haven't. I'll show you the books. I'll take you to the Judaistic bookshops in Johannesburg and Cape Town and go read through those books written by rabbis, man, before and after Christ. Book upon book about tarot card reading and, and huja board playing, you know, written by Judaistic priests and rabbis. Sorry, people. Now, if I speak about that, this book says it's a shame to talk about that stuff. So in this church, we'll talk about Jesus and Him crucified. We will not talk about Satan. But Kubas, I've got so much stuff from my past. Well, go make a turn at the cross. Don't go make a turn at the deliverance ministry. They're going to bind you. They're going to tie you. They're going to keep you fixed to their ties. And they're going to make you feel dependent on judgment. And they're going to feel you, feel, make you feel weak and depressed. Come, I'll show you the cross. And you only have to say, oh, the blood of Jesus. And the blood of Jesus will come, sure, and you'll be a new creation. Is it too tough? Okay, let's go to Revelation. Chapter 12. If you go to the book of Revelation, it says the revelation of Jesus Christ. If you go look at the chapters as from verse 4, 5, 6. He talks about the crucifixion of Christ and the throne, which is the throne of glory. The crucified Christ and the glory that should follow. Now listen what happened. Verse 7. There was war. Not there's going to be war. Not there will be a war. Not there shall be a war. There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought and his angels. Oh, goodness, but there's angels. Well, the word angel means messenger. Could have been rabbis. I don't know. Could have been the rulers of the synagogues. I don't know. And they prevailed not. Neither was their place found anymore in heaven. But there's a proof that Satan was in heaven. No, it doesn't say he was in heaven. It says he didn't have a place anymore in heaven. He didn't say he was living in heaven. He said he found no more place in heaven. Okay, Just look at me before we read on. The scripture that people would use is the book of Job and the book of Zechariah. Job would say, and one day when the sons of God presented themselves before God, he doesn't say heaven and he doesn't say in the eternal life, he doesn't say in the afterlife, he just said they came before God. 
Okay? Now, we read a scripture last night that said, you know, they, they built this place to heaven. But it was just less low. Okay, but forget that. So, <laughs> heaven is around us. Earth is a ball. And where earth stops is heaven. Heaven is not a planet. Heaven is not in the distant future. Heaven is right here. If I'm talking not the truth, how could somebody have their eyes open and see heaven? How could the heavens be open and, and you know, here steps out, you know, Elijah and Moses. Okay, forget that. But in any case, listen to this. It says, one day the sons of God came and presented themselves before God. And Satan came in amongst them. And God said, what are you doing here? So he wasn't supposed to be there. God said, what on earth are you doing here? Job chapter 1 and Job chapter 2. And he says, well, I've been running to and throw on thee. Not in heaven. God says, oh, did you see Job? She said, of course I saw him. Where did he see him? On earth. So where was Satan? On earth. So when he presented himself before God, was he supposed to be there? No. God said, what are you doing here? He said, I'm busy with my duty running to and fro on the earth. Have you got it? So why did he have to be thrown out of heaven? Well, keep there and go to Zechariah chapter 3. Zechariah, right in the back of the Old Testament, chapter 3. And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. What does the Amplified Bible say? To accuse him. Okay. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. How would he rebuke him if it was his place? Oh, come on, just... He says, have no fellowship with the works of darkness. Rebuke it. So here is Joshua standing and here comes Satan. God says, I rebuke you. Even the Lord hath chosen Jerusalem. Rebuke you. He's not as a brand plug out of the fire. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments. And he answered and spake to those that stood before him. Take away the filthy garments. <laughs> Forgive me. Because I have caused his iniquity to pass. And I will clothe him with chains of raiment. Have you got that? And they clothed him with new garments. And the angel of the Lord stood by and said, the end of verse 7, now you can walk here right in my holy presence. Okay, let's go back. I hope you got that. Should I explain it or did you get it? So was Satan living in heaven? No. Was he an archangel that fell? No. Where was his position? On earth. Where did Adam and Eve found him? On earth. Where did he found Job? On earth. What did God say? Where is he coming from? And what did he say? From the earth. What did God say when he found him there? Where are you coming from? And what did God do when he saw him in his presence? He said, I rebuke you. <sighs> so was he a heavenly creature? No, an earthly creature. A created being on the earth. But he found a way into the presence of God to accuse, okay? Sorry if you struggle. There's five messages on the devil. It's not what you thought. Neither was there place found in, anymore in heaven. So the law is not in heaven and Satan is not there. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now! Is come salvation. Okay. Just look at me. Is anybody waiting for salvation to come or are we saved? How did we get saved? Okay. So he says, when I saw this happening in the heavens and this war broke out. So it must have been the cross. Get the message, the battle of Armageddon, proving to you that the battle of Armageddon was the crucified Christ. That was the war that broke out in heaven. It's not a third world war. It was the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. That was the greatest battle on earth for the soul of humanity. For the redemption of your soul, man. And he says, the minute God said, this is finished. Michael, get him out of my presence. I don't want him here. In Zechariah, he already said, I rebuke you. In Job, he already said, what are you doing here? Now he says, 
just get him out of my presence. So Michael took him and cast him out, him and all his messengers. And when they cast him out, it says, Jesus made a display of them triumphing over them in the cross and took the law that stood against you cancel that as well and brought redemption through his blood and now is come salvation the next sentence and the kingdom of our God so what did Jesus bring about repent for the kingdom of heaven is now here what did Jesus do when he appeared unto the disciples for 40 days? Taught them about the things of the kingdom. What message did Paul preach? The message of the kingdom. What did Jesus say we must go preach? Go and preach. Say the kingdom is near and heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers. So the kingdom has come. Salvation has come. So Satan and all his angels with the law is cast out, defeated, took out of the way. You can live a conquering, overcoming, victorious life liberated life in the spirit hallelujah